Hello, welcome to Reality TV. I'm your host, Raymond Bakari, and today I'm joined by Megan Cotter, who is running to be the next state representative for District 39 here in Rhode Island. Ms. Cotter, how are you today? I'm good. Thank you for having me. No problem. Thank you for coming on the show. It's a pleasure of mine to have you on. Just diving right into the questions, you are running to be the next uh, state representative for District 39. What influenced your decision to run for state representative in, 30, in District 39 again? Well, I wasn't fully committed after um, the 2020 campaign. Um, I lost by 321 votes. So when you come that close, you know, I was definitely considering a second run. And then um, a few things happened that really kind of uh, triggered me to run again. My representative that I lost to, um, he decided not to vote in the budget. He didn't want to put a mask on to go in to vote. And I thought, you know, for, for our district, any district, to not have representation vote one way or another on the budget, it's, it's shameful. And our community deserves better than that. We deserve a voice at the state house. We deserve someone who's going to discuss the issues that we care about, that's going to push for the issues we care about. And showing up to vote on the budget is one of the basic things that you can do as a state representative. And so after that had happened, I was definitely leaning towards running again. And then the events on, on January 6th took place. And I thought it was a, an opportunity to really throw my name out there a second time. And, and so I decided that I was going to run again. And you did mention that you uh, had ran against Representative Justin Price previously in the 2020 election, and you lost by 321 votes. Are there any differences you see with this campaign compared to your first one for the seat? Absolutely. I came very, very close uh, to winning. Eight months prior to the, uh, to the election, people in Richmond and Hopkinton didn't even know my name. Most people in Exeter didn't know my name unless they were involved. You know, I'm, I'm involved in the school um, with my children. I'm a basketball coach, so I, I knew people from the school, but as far as the political scene, it really wasn't very um, well known. And now I'm the um, chairwoman of the Exeter Democratic Town Committee. I'm obviously very active in uh, local politics and now people know my name and I came close when they didn't. So um, we're doing things differently. Obviously we're starting to fundraise a lot earlier. We're gonna earn, um, we're gonna um, earn raise um, more money than we did in the 2020 campaign. And I've formed a, uh, an advisory board of people within my district that, that are on my team um, that are gonna help really get us to where we need to be across the finish line. I feel very confident that we can do it this time around. And you did mention Representative Price, Representative Justin Price, for those watching, is the current state representative for District 39. He's a Republican, and you had ran against him in 2020. Speaking of him, he's under fire recently, well, semi-recently, but still sort of recently, for being at the Trump rally that turned into a violent protest that led to many of those supporters storming the United States Capitol building. Both Republicans and Democrats have condemned that violent protest, but Representative Price hasn't exactly. He said he was there, but didn't storm the Capitol. And then he blamed the storming of the Capitol on Antifa, saying they had infiltrated that protest. This has led to calls for him to resign as well. Should Representative, Pre Representative Price resign and why or why not? Well, I, I'm not calling for him to resign for a few reasons. You know, one, I, I don't think it would be appropriate for me to call for his resignation, considering I just lost him recently. Um, and I think that if, if he just went, uh, you know, in 2016, when Trump got elected, plenty of people rallied um, against Trump. And, and I don't have a problem with him going to a rally. I do have a problem with the dangerous misinformation that that he is spreading. Antifa is not a group. Antifa is an idea. It, and it stands for anti-fascism. And I think when, when you spread misinformation that Antifa did it or, or people from Black Lives Matter did this, I, I think it's really dangerous. When we're in a time when our, our community here in District 39 is very, very divided, um, we need to start operating in facts instead of ideas um, that have no, no truth based. Um, there's no evidence of anything he has said. So to spread that kind of dangerous rhetoric uh, is, is really, really uh, concerning. And while we're on the topic of the numerous debates that had came from the Trump rally that on January 6th that turned to a violent protest, a lot of conservatives, while agreeing that the events occurred on January, that occurred on January 6th are condemnable, regardless of whatever your political affiliation is, 
also point out how there wasn't the same energy in condemning and calls for resigning among perpetrators during this past summer when major cities were being looted, burned, and destroyed after the death of George Floyd. Do you feel that there was the same amount of energy and effort to condemn those riots this past summer? And if so, should elected officials that egged it on and didn't condemn those riots be called upon to resign similar to how elected officials like Representative Price are currently being called upon to resign? I think you have to look at every situation um, and you have to really look at why the why matters, I think. And uh, though I do not uh, think any anything is worth rioting over, um, I do think that when Black people say we don't want to be murdered, <laughs> um, it's a lot different than trying to overturn a, a, a democratic you know, a democratic election. And we have to look at the, the reasons why things happen. And I really do think that we need to start trying to understand where the other side is coming from a little bit better. When we have such a divided nation um, where people can't see why the other side is acting the way that they are, we really need to take a big step back. I, I think COVID, everyone being isolated in their homes and watching Fox or um, you know whatever news news uh, channel you you watch, looking at the social media that is really geared towards whatever your uh, preference is. So you could you could scroll through Facebook right now. You know I would see if I were to bring up my Facebook, it would be all left articles, right? Um, a Republican would see all right articles. And I think by this isolation, we've really kind of come to this point where we're not even seeing the other side. And there's no more conversation anymore. So I think we need to take a big step back and ask why. Why is they? Why are these things happening? Why do people feel the way that they feel? Maybe we can come to <laughs> some kind of understanding. So do do you um do you feel that there was the same amount of energy and effort to condemn the riots this past summer? And if those elected officials who didn't condemn it as much as they did with the January sixth riot, should they be called upon to resign, like how Representative Price is? people that's the yeah the, i think people felt um there was as much outrage it just was from different sides honestly you know the the right was outraged in the summer and the left was outraged from january 6th and uh so what about so for certain elected officials if they didn't condemn it as much as the riots on january 6th were being condemned should they be called to resign um like who i'm sorry i'm i'm well, the, the, the arguments are that there are certain elected officials like Congresswoman Ilhan Omar, for example, she had uh, pounded the message of defunding the police and um, with Bill de Blasio, of mayor, the mayor of New York City, they had defunded the police, cut a billion dollars of their budget. And the argument from the conservatives are saying that there was not a lot of condemning going on for those riots this past summer when, when there was a lot of condemning for the January 6th riot, because they're agreeing with, with your side that the riots are condemnable in any way, shape or form. But they're not. They're not. Their argument is that there wasn't the similar energy in the summer. And my question is, if they didn't condemn the riots, similar to how the ones on January six, the one on January six was, should they be called to, to resign? I don't think so. I think. I think that again, you know, we need to start looking at why the why on the other side. I think that there's just a lot of. We just don't understand the other side and the under, other side doesn't understand us. I think that's kind of how it's working right now. We need to really work harder to go across the aisle and understand why the events of January 6th happened, why the events in the summertime happened, and, and to really understand what makes people tick. Moving away from that topic and now on to some of the policies and issues that are highlighted on your campaign website. One of those is that you want to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour. Currently, that is most likely to pass in the General Assembly. It just passed the Senate uh, semi recently. Critics argue that this growth in wages would not only hurt small businesses, especially during this pandemic, since they're struggling and unable to stay open in most cases, but also that the growth in wages would be canceled out by prices of items going up, since companies would recognize people have more of an expendable income. There is also another argument argument used against raising the minimum wage that this would speed up automation as well. What is your response to those arguments used against raising the minimum wage and raising it and would raising it, especially during the pandemic, hurt small businesses in any way, shape or form? I think that right now we have a, a lot of people who don't make a livable wage and they are being subsidized by, um, you know, state state 
subsidizing. So you have Section 8, you have um, food stamps. I'm not saying these things should be taken away, obviously. But if people are making a livable wage and they're able to provide for themselves, that will free up a lot of funds that could be put into small businesses in our state that could help our, our small businesses succeed. And I, I think that uh, Forbes magazine and, and many other magazines have done plenty of uh, studies to show that minimum wage has stayed the same while CEOs and, and profits for companies continue to climb. So I think it's time that we start uh, thinking about raising the minimum wage. We haven't even, if you look at the federal minimum wage, it stayed the same for the last, I think, 30 years. And in terms of uh, small businesses, do you, do you feel that raising it during this pandemic would hurt them, the small businesses? I think that we would have to find a way to subsidize small businesses like we have been in the state and, and continue to do so through the pandemic. And are, are there any concerns that it would increase automation? We're headed towards automation anyway. I mean, you go into any stop and shop or Walmart, um, any grocery store and you, you know, how many, you have like 10 self checkouts in one person. We're headed there regardless of what minimum wage is. I don't and, think it'll speed it up. And the uh, final follow up for this uh, topic, the argument of prices being raised by companies to cancel out growth, what, were, what would be the solution to addressing that problem when, if the minimum wage were to be raised? I think that there are certain, um, certain, I personally would rather spend an extra 50 cents on my milk and have the person checking me out would make a livable wage. And I think there are many people who feel that way. Um, I think that people are willing to pay a little bit more to make sure that the person that's taking care of them is able to feed their family and pay their bills. Moving on to another another priority that you have on your campaign website that also has a chance of being passed this, uh, this legislative session is legalizing marijuana in Rhode Island. There are highlighted pros on your website saying the potential revenue. However, a lot of concerns highlighted by critics of this are it possible increases in crime, car accidents, insurance rates going up from those potential increases in car accidents. And one issue that's here in Providence currently where I reside is speed bumps all over. Are those legitimate concerns to be raised if marijuana were to be legalized in Rhode Island? And if so, how would they be addressed during the process of passing that legislation? I think those concerns are real, but I think people are going across the border into Massachusetts and, and buying legally buying marijuana and taking it back to Rhode Island and, and using it here. So I think that that's not um, gonna change. We can tax it and regulate it and Rhode Island can actually benefit from it because right now Massachusetts is benefiting from it. We are not. And there is no regulations right now because it's illegal. So um, I think those are all legitimate concerns that need to be ironed out, but we're not making any, we're not gaining any tax revenue without doing this, Massachusetts is. And, and that's something that we have to really uh, consider. We have a giant budget and no money to uh, supply and, and, and fund all the programs that we need to fund. So I think that that is um, a way that we can gain some tax revenue. We, we have to. And in regards to the, to the issues like possible raises in crimes and increased speed bumps across our cities, what, what, cause you mentioned those would need to be ironed out. Are there any uh, methods to ironing those out during the process of this legislation? I know that there have been studies and there's uh, there's work that's being done as far as uh, like you have a breathalyzer for alcohol. I know that they're working on ways to quickly identify if someone is high. Um, I think that obviously those things need to happen. But again, people are smoking pot now. It's not going to legalizing it. It's not I don't think all of a sudden everyone's going to run out and go buy pot and smoke it any more so than people are doing it now. They're just going across the border into Massachusetts and giving that, that state the tax revenue. Moving on to another big issue that a lot of more progressive Democrats, many of them being members of the political co-op like yourself, aren't in favor of is charter schools, the expansion of them. The argument for charter schools is that it could be a good alternative way to say a failing public school here in Providence where that whole situation required a state takeover. Why is it a problem for there to be more charter schools that would give more options to say a parent who wants their child to have to, to not have to go to a failing public school here in Providence, for example? The problem with it is that what if, you know, parent A and parent B both put their child in to go to the charter school and parent A gets picked? What about child B? They go to a failing public school. 
and we need to invest in our public schools. You know, I, uh, I know you had uh, Mayor Fung on your show. He and I both went to classical in Providence. Um, I'm a proud Providence public school graduate. If I didn't get into classical, I would have gone to Mount Pleasant and maybe my experience in high school would have been different. And I don't think that's right. And it's not fair to the children who end up going to said failing schools. We need to invest in our schools, all of them. And, you know, I think charter schools are great, but it's not fair to the kids that aren't selected for charter schools. And there's simply not enough charter schools for everyone. So instead of investing more in charter schools, we should be investing in our public schools. And we haven't been, it's been inadequate. I think classical, for example, they haven't had a new roof put on since the seventies. And it's been, it was leaking when I graduated in 2002. And I know they haven't put a new roof on since then. So we're not investing properly in our future, which is our children. The proponents of charter schools also bring up issues like school choice, but still staying on the topic of the charter school expansions. It is also argued that charter schools supposedly, um, well, from the critics, they argue that it supposedly takes resources and money away from the public schools. The proponents respond with the what they say is the harsh reality that the schools, the charter schools perform better than the public schools and that the teacher unions, uh, their words are that the teacher unions are, are demanding more and getting greedier and the same results in the testing scores, attendance and dropout rates are showing no signs of improvements. Are the teacher unions as higher demands and lack of improvement on performance to be the blame for the failures of public school systems and public schools, like say for example, here in Providence? And if not, who would be to blame? I don't believe we can blame our teachers. Uh, I, I think that the teachers work long hours, they work hard hours and they're mostly dedicated, I say mostly, because everybody's had that one teacher that's not, right? Um, I, I would blame, honestly, our budget. Our budget doesn't cut enough money out for our children and for our future. And that's why things like legalizing marijuana and generating more tax revenue and putting it into our children is really what we need to, we need to focus on. Cut the money from somewhere else if we have to. Our children are our future. And if we're not gonna fund them, what are we gonna fund? Would there be any places that, as a legislator, that you would recommend to, to cut to bring more money to the public schools? Well, I think if you, if you legalize marijuana right there, you're going to create millions of dollars in tax revenue, probably in the first year alone. Um, I think if you start there and then really take a closer look at the budget and see where else, what, what other fat can be cut. There are other things that we could do, you know, uh, it, take schools, for example, you look at a, a, a place, a state like Texas. So Rhode Island would have one superintendent in the state of Texas, because that would be the entire uh, district would be one superintendent. Rhode Island is broken down. How many superintendents do we have? You know, obviously I'm not advocating for anybody to lose their job, but there's things that we can do where we can invest more in our children instead of the fat around the school. And um, where would, where would, because you did mention invest in the children, that's where the, also the argument of school choice comes in. Where would you stand on a potential measure to pass uh, school choice? Uh, it, it's difficult for me coming from someone who uh, lives as an adult in a, in a district like Exeter West Greenwich, we have a regional school. I don't even know if we have charter schools. Uh, to be honest, my children attend public schools. I think that um, it's a difficult choice for any parent to make. And I think, again, we have to invest in our public schools, as opposed to bringing in more charter schools. Another policy on your uh, campaign website is that you also want the state of Rhode Island to move to 100% renewable energy by 2030. Are there any plans in that plan to pass? Because I've heard a lot of uh, push by the progressive Democrats recently to pass a Green New Deal in the state of Rhode Island. Is that similar to that agenda? Like, would that be a part of that? There's a lot of misinformation about a Green New Deal. When I was knocking on doors in the campaign in 2020, I knocked on a door and um, I was talking about Rhode Island passing a Green New Deal. And the gentleman said, well, I need my car. You can't take my car from me. And I thought, "What? I, I didn't understand the misinformation. And um, after I had done my homework and my research and realized that there is a lot of misinformation about what a Green New Deal is, I started talking about renewable energy in a different way because I think that there's so much misinformation about a Green New Deal that when we talk about renewable energy, we have to talk about what that means, transitioning to renewable energy, transitioning to um, you know solar, wind farms, um, and, and other 
and other uh, the, the progressive Democrats have this little windmill they've been doing research on and it sits on top of a roof and it generates energy that way. So not only can you have solar on your roof, you can have a miniature windmill. I mean, the technology is, is just developing at such a rapid rate. It's impressive and there's only one way to go. And in terms of the budget, is there a, an estimated cost for how much, say, a Green New Deal would cost in Rhode Island? Well, I think that uh, when you look at it, you have to take into a lot, of, there are a lot of factors to take into consideration and the amount of job creations would certainly be one. Um, and also we're already giving tax credits and revenue towards uh, transitioning to green energy. So this would just be an additional um, expenditure that I think we're already spending. We're already giving tax credits to, you know, um, national grid and other energy um, companies. So this is nothing different. Is there um, the estimated cost? Because say, for example, on the national level with uh, Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez, when she introduced the Green New Deal, it's expected to cost at minimum $10 trillion a year. Is there an estimated cost for how much that would cost on a state level here in Rhode Island if it were to pass? I'm not sure. I, I know that obviously it's going to cost something, but I don't have a, a figure in front of me. Um, and just if that were to pass, is there, because the concerns are with the things like the Green New Deal, that taxes would go up for a lot of residents, especially in the middle class. Has that been on the, the mindset when looking into passing something like this or uh, in, the, in your case of uh, advocating for it? I'm not sure how the taxes would go up on the middle class. It wouldn't affect uh, the middle class. It, it really, honestly, if we if we look at how we generate income and we legalize marijuana and we start taxing the wealthy, the middle class will not be impacted by this. And my uh, my final question is one that I ask everyone on the show here to keep tradition, and that is, in your opinion, what do you think Rhode Island is best known for? Squid. Um, someone coming from the fishing industry and working day in and day out, um, squid is certainly we're the number one importer and exporter. If you didn't know. <laughs> of squid and uh, everyone throughout the country when they talk about squid and where the best squid comes from it is it's called loligo it is uh east coast squid thank you once again miss cotter for coming on the show it's been a pleasure of mine to have you on thank you so much i, I really appreciate it no problem it's a pleasure of mine to have you on and thank you once again for watching this episode of reality tv if you want to see future episodes as soon as they're posted on this channel please click the subscribe button down below along with the post notification bell icon to the right of it I'm your host, Rain Bakari, and I'll see you on the next episode.